राइटोलॉजिस्ट Uh, who uh, that means a person who is making predictions on elections and also a journalist and he is the founder and editor in chief in uh, 538 uh, which is a company that's making forecast mainly on elections and uh, he is a special correspondent for abc news and he is mainly specialized in analyzing baseball and elections and uh, in us he is a uh, famous uh, for predicting the results of 28 uh, us presidential elections that means he has predicted 49 out of 50 states correctly and all 50 states in 2012 when he was a disaster you know uh, he was uh, extremely uh, he failed miserably in 2016 <laughs> uh, he got it right yeah he is got it right yeah uh, so uh, talking about this book uh, it's the signal and the noise and he it, it has won an award uh, on for uh, phi beta kappa award in science 2013 which is awarded to one of the most significant book on uh, science and mathematicians in the world and he himself calls that this book is on a book that includes the art and science of predictions and i would be going towards some key points in this book so the first point is that uh, the signal and the noise so what's this signal that this book is talking on and what's this noise is a question that you also may be thinking of now so uh, ever since the invention of the printing machines in 1914 and it's a uh, inventions in uh, throughout the history the amount of useful information uh, that's been shared and can be reused has been exploded so this was further enhanced by the use by by the invention of the internet and so the amount of information that's created and shared via internet was exploded as you can see in the figures so but the amount of useful information not was not growing in the same rate so uh so for instance that you are an invest investor and you would like to predict how the economy would be in around 2025 so uh, you may not know or somebody of you may know that us government Uh, produce 45000 economic indicators each year uh, so for mainly for the economics related so if you are an investor then you would have to go through all of these economic indicators uh, and you would have to select which one to choose for your predictions and which one to exclude so uh, in this book a uh, net silver Uh, is selling saying telling that uh, what is the signal and what's this noise he says that the signal is the truth and the distractions are the noise that means the variables which are uh, which we must be focusing on are the signals and the other variables are the noise so say for instance that unemployment rate is the variable which you should be focusing on and it's highly correlated with the economy of the of us so uh, the unemployment rate is the signal and all the other 44999 variables are just noise so he says that the signal is the truth and the noise are the other variables but that means what that distracts us from the truth and also more data means more noise noise in relation to the signal so the problem here is that we humans have hyperactive pattern recognition so this may be have helped at thousands of years ago 
uh, to figure out the sound coming from that bush, it's a lion or it's a bird, but it's really harming us when making predictions. So as humans, when uh, someone presented us with a series of numbers or text, when then we tend to see patterns in those texts or either numbers. Uh, so those patterns uh, can be either exist there or there aren't any patterns like that in that text or even the numbers. So Ned Silver says that uh, humans are very over active and overconfidence in making predictions because humans uh, tend to identify more patterns among the noise. Uh, so uh, the productivity paradox, paradox is a very central uh, part of this book. So what's this productivity paradox? Uh, in years 1970 and 1980s, and also in re more recently in 20, uh, 2000 to 2020, uh, there had been a, uh, an uh, area and a time period that the productivity paradox works taken place. That means in that area, uh, it, at that time period, many developments in IT related technologies has been taken off, but the productivity of the research and the science was not so high. Uh, and it was very slow down in the developments in the history. So scientists called that uh, era as a productivity paradox, or it's also known as a slow solo paradox. And uh, Ned Silver, Silver has told that uh, we face danger whenever information growth outpaces our understanding on how to process it. That means we had many uh, access to many sources of information and also data. So, but humans were not uh, capable and also they were not aware of uh, how to uh, make good progress and good use of this available information. Uh, so activity, actually this was uh, around uh, 1970s and it was uh, taking place until 1990s. So in after 1990s, research and productivity has begun to improve again. Uh, so this actually uh, has been uh, invaded and more influenced by the invention of the printing machine because invention of the printing machine has caused to uh, uh, emerge of uh, many ideologies that mainly are focused on religion. That means myths has been uh, explored and printed and distributed uh, all over the US. So that's actually something uh, that take, that has taken place during this era. And the second uh, main point is that uh, we have a prediction problem. And this uh, book uh, talks about some catastrophic failures of the prediction, uh, where he talks about that. It also talks about the calamitous failures of production uh, prediction. So one of the uh, failure of prediction is that uh, the failure to predict uh, 28 housing bubble and recursion. Uh, so uh, this uh, 2008 ho housing bubble and recursion was very famous in uh, United States history. Uh, so many people has involved in predicting uh, this uh, housing bubble and what could happen in this, that area and how to mitigate from the risk. But uh, actually no one has uh, able to successfully predict this uh, recursion. And one instant is that uh, Standard & Poor is a very famous uh, forecasting company in US. So it has tried to uh, predict this and uh, they were actually failed to uh, predict it uh, very clearly because this is uh, some instant of uh, where they have uh, tried to predict the forecast of the, uh, the amount of uh, houses that will uh, lead to default. That means, uh, actually this is more related to economics. That means if someone was unable to pay their house rents, then uh, the, that house will lead to default. That means 
uh, uh, it will the, the ownership of the house will be uh, directed to a third party uh, which is called as a uh, collect collaterated debt obligations uh, so the amount of uh, houses that was uh, led to default was the forecasted amount was only a point 12 percent but actually 28 percent of the houses were led to default so it's a major failure so secondly the rise of temperature is also another thing that the forecasters tried to predict so in 1990 ipcc which is the international uh, panel of climate change forecasted that the rise of temperature uh, would most like to be 3 percent per century and it uh, and at least not less than two percent but in 2012 at the time of releasing this book it, it was only on only just uh, 1.5 degrees celsius and also, uh, many forecasters tried to predict the GDP forecast. Uh, they predicted that uh, they have done it up to 18 years from 2008, 2010 to 1993, as shown in this figure. So uh, most of them had say, uh, said that uh, by 1993, uh, there's a 90 percent chance of chance of ending up. Uh, for all of the years, but the economics were correct only 66%. And also, the fourthly, the Great Depression of 1990 is also a failure prediction that has been done. The economics were, here were only able to predict two out of 60 depressions that had occurred worldwide one year ahead of time. So uh, what are the reasons of these failures you think? So firstly, we can blame the black swan events. So what are these black swan events? Uh, these are some of the unpredictable events uh, that is beyond our control. That means that humans can't control these. Uh, that is a normally unexpected situation. And also these black swan events are uh, very, uh, the outcomes of the black swan and events can be very severe. So as humans, we can blame those kinds of events when our predictions get wrong. Uh, but actually, it's uh, very unlikely uh, to blame like this because uh, firstly, the main fault can be in ourselves. That means the forecaster's model is also wrong. So it's one of the major issues. Uh, but actually, as humans, uh, we should show some sympathy because uh, there can be situations where predictions are extra difficult to make, where I can, I will describe in further slides. And also secondly, the second reason can be the event is out of sample. So uh, the major reason uh, why the 20, 2008 housing bubble and regression prediction was failed was because uh, the forecasters had no sample data uh, to include for their models and test. So that was actually a major re reason where most of the uh, real world problems of uh, uh, the, the models for the real world problems are getting failed. And also thirdly, uh, dynamic systems is also a reason because uh, dynamic system is that means uh, when the behavior of a system at one point in time influences the behavior in the future, then we call that a dynamic system. And they are actually nonlinear. That means uh, they are abide by the exponential rather than additive relationships. That means uh, if we uh, make a change in the inputs, a slight amount of time, but a slight amount of input, but they ended up being very uh, uh, huge and in the future. Uh, so likewise the behavior of the earth's atmosphere uh, the movement of its tectonic plates which brings the earthquakes and also the complex human interactions uh, that occur that uh, affects the behavior of the economy and also the spread of infectious diseases like the coronavirus these systems are very complex and also uh, they have been studied by the forecasters and the scientists but uh, these are actually some complex and dynamic systems. Uh, so 
Uh, these systems make forecasting more difficult and also the predictions in these fields have not gone very well. Uh, for some examples of economy, weather and the pandemics like the coronavirus. Uh, so predictions in these uh, areas are very difficult. And also a lack, the lack of theory is also a reason for the failure of the predictions. Here, the net silver address, uh, tells that the forecasters just don't know about many of the systems and the forecasters don't know the theoretical background behind those uh, problems and the use cases and those scenarios. And those experts tend to more tend, uh, to tend their attention more to the observations than on the theory. That means uh, the forecasters don't see uh, what's happening in the actual world. Instead, the forecasters, uh, so the net silver points that instead of that, the forecasters uh, should mainly consider on the computer, that means the statistical background, and also they also need to consider about the human judgments. So uh, he tells that the, every prediction always need to be a proper assessment of human being. That means the every prediction we make that should be a statistic based and also there should be a human judgment. That means human knowledge should also uh, be included in that. So um, I'll give you example. Go to LinkedIn and uh, look at my articles and think of my article on the uh, 2016 election while I explain something. See the shows. Go to LinkedIn, my account, and look at my So it's a very interesting thing. Um, how do you predict that Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania will go to uh, Trump in 2016? Um, and uh, the uh, data that you collect, uh, you have to post uh, because uh, you know all the data that you collect is there to you know, go to uh, you know, yeah, yeah. So look at this here. Um, Yes, and then we then we uh, this will have so, uh, uh, and then we uh, link to other ones so two thousand sixteen also uh, then the other one for two thousand so then um, on uh, March five uh, two thousand and sixteen in primary elections or GOP. In Ohio, Rick Sunker uh, won. How would you predict that? Because uh, the number of, uh, you know, in, um, in the primary election, things um, change rapidly. So, in this, I was able to uh, look at the sentiment, emotion, and volume. And I was able to, uh, I knew what was the result based on polls. And then I used social media to understand the uh, movement. And I saw um, uh, uh, Rick Sandron overtake Trump and other people. Uh, and the last two, three, Four days, and I predicted that he will win, which he did. It was extremely unusual to be able to do so. There were 10 you know, contenders, right? And at that time, the samples are too small. In fact, um, these guys, uh, uh, 538 and all, we're not able to uh, do that correctly uh, because they have to print the poll, and this is a dynamic situation. There was on this one here, election day, as it was posted on election day, November 8th. It's a live blog. And uh, we had licensed, uh, at, you know, that earlier that year, just two months ago, I licensed the PT system to Cognom Labs. You know, we had found from the national. <coughs> and if you go down here, see at uh, one thirty. Going against the flow, which is dangerous at 1 p.m., Florida was not looking 
positive for giving people one in motion driven term sentiment feeling. And I, it was a human judgment as to which one I want to believe. And uh, this was entirely unexpected. The posts were all showing Hillary to be in Florida. Later on, I was able to sense that, uh, and this was a uh, reason why I uh, was able to call Trump Hillary again. Um, at that point, uh, nine, uh, some very large percentage of the, um, um, I think there was a 70 percent or some higher percent, uh, that kind of high percentage chance that Hillary will be when I called for Trump. And what I saw was um, uh, Pennsylvania, and this was a thing about eight years, uh, and that uh, I saw the uh, support for Trump, the rule Pennsylvania, versus democratic support in the uh, urban uh, Pennsylvania, and based on that, I said Pennsylvania will go for Trump. And that, uh, say, that gave me uh, a sense that, um, uh, uh, Trump will win the electoral, uh, you know, thing and not in the thing. So there was, uh, so there's a lot of data, millions of leaks that we could analyze. But the context, human interpretation is very important. So the point that he makes is that these are issues that are not solved uh, fully by uh, statistics or uh, polling or vote, you know, other things. You need to have a judgment. Similarly, in 2014 election, when Modi won, uh, you know, uh, the uh, particularly the um, you know, predicting the um, the degree of need, okay, was also uh, something where um, there are 545 um, seats in in the parliament, uh, Lok Sabha, and uh, well, many seats are won by one or two percent. And then a boundary is such that it is very hard to say that this tweet is from this constitution versus that, right? So uh, all those tweets were a very challenging issue where human knowledge of uh, the electoral system, the uh, you know, uh, general margins, the um, uh, multi-way uh, party and multiple parties, so. Uh, in, you know, winning uh, in the margins are small. Um, the, uh, so many other things have to be factored in before you can make those calls, and that is how we are able to uh, you know, make many of these calls. Right? So I had um, for uh, eight years I had um, uh, hundred percent you know uh, success rate, and uh, that was you know again not purely so. Um, I think this is very less data compared to any other social media. And one of the main reasons was semantic reason. In that, um, you know, all the social media, there was a social media, uh, um, um, you know, um, the, the biggest social media company in that time uh, had um, not the social media platform, but the, uh, you know, companies like. Uh, uh, the one that Manus worked for us, uh, you know, in the media. Yeah. Huh? Data Manus. Data Manus. Yeah. Uh, they were, then and other companies were extremely wrong. Way wrong. While I was correct. And um, the big problem was that they had too much noise. They didn't like too much. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything in this that surprises you in this book? Um, actually, he explains the reasons for the failure and what Are we you can. Surprised? Yeah. You surprised by this failure? Because uh, okay. those failures are somewhat related to the failures that we face when doing yeah. research. Yeah. But so, so you're not surprised. You've seen how this thing works. Yeah, uh, but, but they are mostly, we are seeing it in our perspective where in research, in mainly AI and those stuff. But uh, 
so the author has seen it in it in the social perspective how it relates to elections and other like baseball predictions for the yeah well i i just think all of this boils down to an open world an open mm -hmm. dynamic world and let's talk about that <laughs> the world is dynamic and there's lots of features in it yeah. and the models are flawed um on the on 2008 market crash um, there's a great movie which if, if you want to amuse yourself with something that's intellectually um appropriate it's called the big short yeah. the big short and and you know what i object to is the implication that you were just you know, from the book that this was not knowable this was 100 knowable there were people that absolutely foresaw the 2008 housing market and it's a little bit surprising when when they sure come out about the same time as the book came out so it's very 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 good um i, I i'm not a fan of this mapping of signal and noise this is very confusing so how do you, what do you guys think about the use of the word signal and noise here compared to the way you guys usually think about signal to noise ratio what do you think about that is that is that fit yeah it's totally different and it's very it's it's very confusing yeah. to me i i i don't think about it that way so i know what it is <laughs> you don't need to explain to me <laughs> as i looked at that i thought i didn't tell you guys about second and second theory which i could have uh, but um. so just there is something that i will say which is um not just a theory and the science, but from practice, it's such a long time that um, so many uh, companies, 100, 200 million of investments, have not figured out the value of uh, scenario filters or uh, beyond uh, keywords. So the, um, the way um, Education and science have you know, developed is that uh, before AI, um, uh, when I started the social media, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, party company in 1999, what was the um, Google has started, but it's not really that big a deal. And uh, Google was there with uh, age rank, but the Machine learning part was anyway. What was the big thing then? Other than there's a huge internet market, web market, what was the big thing? I am. And the first set of things that people developed was information keywords. It started with PFIDF and then it kept on you know uh, changing. But hundred percent of the world. Whether it was TFRDR or LSI, SA, or any other way to find search and similar content was all um, data -driven and all um, uh, you know keyword based. There's nothing else. And they could do clustering and pay me and all this stuff. The thing that I figured out that I think nobody else uh, figured out in the you know, social media world. All those years that I had that, uh, you know, Tali and Sinaitis is the new of knowledge of intelligence. Later on, you see the influence of say, we found a company for this dissertation, right? When he's speaking to the model, he's saying, okay, I'm going to listen to the Twitter uh, tweets that uh, I post all, all interest with and use it to create the model, which will be used to semantically filter the tweets that we of interest to him, of uh, suppose a person is uh, you know, is following hundred other people on on Twitter, uh, and each of their posts makes one post, a thousand posts, and you don't have time to see thousand posts when you get up. So how are you going to get the top ten or twenty? You know, rank them right, creating understanding the interest of the user and ranking them is the very important. You can create the interest in a way that Google did earlier on. See, from the very early point, Google started creating a uh, profile for you, which was basically a, uh, a, a string or vector uh, uh, made from all the queries that you had asked. And uh, 
something about the uh, uh, clicks that you are doing. So you click means that means you like the response. And taking those concepts, they created essentially uh, in your profile. So what happens is that you will query uh, search happens, results are then ordered based on your interest. But that was all based on keyword sets. Nothing was based on uh, uh, say, uh, you know, semantics and meaning. And they would not have the ability to understand exactly that car and automobiles are pretty much the same. They would have statistical uh, you know, uh, you know, indication in the uh, algorithm that cars and uh, if you use LSI, cars and road will come up, you know, uh, close, the cosine would be one. But uh, you not know that they are the same, that they, they mean the same, right? That is that we, we, we figure out. That is in the pattern. If you see that semantic web, uh, such, you know, uh, that is what the The interesting thing is that I was with my company uh, till 2006. Then I moved uh, to um, Price State and I was not associated with the company anymore. For that six, seven years, not a single company in the market went to see. It took that long time. So uh, similarly, uh, knowledge graph or, or world model is something we use uh, in our commercial protocols already in 2000. Google came out with string, uh, things not strings, entities not keywords in 2013. It took that long a time for them to understand the power of this. So what, what, what I'm trying to tell you is that much of the success of you know, our students or group has been to be that ahead in figuring out what makes sense. So what is unique and what is different. And if you think about it, I had terrible time going against, uh, you know, uh, to sell this approach. I remember uh, talking to the chief scientist of Yahoo. Yahoo was a big company in 2009 and then Yahoo still was a big company. Right, uh, much bigger than Google. But um, uh, uh, I went to see this guy, and uh, the, this guy was a former professor from Arizona State, and he only understood, you know, the clustering and keywords and IR. So for me to tell him that I'm doing something that is going to be better than that is better than page rank and um, uh, you know. Um, uh, machine learning, uh, it was very hard selling. He didn't buy it basically. So I couldn't get them as a customer as an example. Right? Um, but and then, of course, and then when Google came, of course, everybody saw the business because they, of course, in the market share. Unfortunately for me, I had to, uh, you know, take the company uh, just selling the financial services market so that, that so I, I was no longer hosting zero purpose web search kind of thing. Uh, but nevertheless, anyway, that kind of condition and, and that really being that different, uh, you know, and against the state of sort of thing is what made for that longevity, you know, uh, long lasting sort of uh, success. And all the uh, things about semantics is what they is the only one I want to do. So, uh, you know, that. Going beyond the statistics to do the semantics, you know that was the. This was the reason why um, um, the moment the coverage of the poll was not very good, and um, the many issues in voting. I discussed that in one of the article. Uh, in fact, I in one of those articles I talk about failure of all the uh, polling companies. In 2016, everybody was called, you know, wrong. And uh, to see that signal, there are different positions. The other very important thing that I realized in those days is the power of emotion, not sentiment. So we are the first one in the entire you know, social media analytics universe to employ emotion, not just the sentiment. The sentiment is uh, negative, positive, neutral, and positive. That gives you very little information. Emotion is much more varied. And uh, emotions uh, lead to the decision. Uh, you know, people want, you know, uh, because they are light leaning uh, and they 
are happy with let's say GOP and their, their ideology. They don't want uh, you know uh, so uh, sentiment of the three says when it was. And another very important thing was sentiment about what? Suppose and I try to give example uh, from the work that um, uh, Lin, uh, uh, Chen Ludi, the PhD student Chen Ludi, uh, uh, on topic sentiment, uh, specific and uh, you know, sentiment analysis in ICWSL 2012, is that you have um, uh, King's speech is so so, but calling out was gay. Right? Now, what is the sentiment on this sheet? If you compute the sentiment of the T as well, you got it wrong. You have to say there's an entity called King Speech, which happens to be movie. There's an entity named Collins uh, Park, uh, who is an actor. Neutral sentiment on uh, you know uh, movie, positive sentiment on Collins Park. Right? That was so we uh, filed for pattern, unfortunately. Lou had submitted the paper on submission, even though we withdrew. Patent officer found out that that was submitted. So, on that ground, he uh, declined giving us the patent. Second patent. We did get the patent for the work that Mila and Kat submitted with me on spatial temporal thematics. But sentiment, emotion, intent analysis, we had this uh, topic specific center here, part of patent on this uh, thing um, that was denied. Then we published in ICT. But um, uh, so again, you know, thinking about uh, sentiment, sorry, spatial uh, uh, temporal thematics, people content network. That was the emphasis of uh, uh, Hammond's work. And sentiment emotion analysis was the uh, thing was emotion was uh, when we went, and uh, sentiment was uh, and subjectivity was uh, all changed, right? Yeah. That, so these things, spatial temporal thematic, people can then network, sentiment, emotion, uh, intent, real time analysis of street things. That was, again, totally different, right? The nobody has did these many ways of looking at, um, you know, uh, the content. There are so many different facets or features. But the thing that I am um, excited about is that each of the features that I told you, I can explain to you. The feature of sentiment and emotion, as opposed to these hundred thousand, you know, million parameters or uh, large number of features that you don't know what they stand for, right? So um, uh, my hope would be that one of you would think critically. There were all these, you know, um, uh, deep learning, um, multi-dimensional vector space. Is it possible to aggregate them into meaningful chunks that have a semantic uh, representation that you can use and explain? That will make a unique difference, not the way, you know. Uh, and, you know so think along that line and see how you can add, right? And most don't, go, don't just go with uh, the herd. The, the herd was going with say, keyword analysis. They had massive platforms, they can do all these things. Uh, a lot of people can do a little bit of real, it's all real time. We did a lot of engineering, they did a lot of engineering. But the semantics are very You can able to take you know, uh, knowledge from Wikipedia and incorporate. So suppose you say Hallmark. Hallmark is a, a there are three companies with the title of Hallmark. Three companies. Each Hallmark has and if you can't distinguish the three, that means you can never say what are you talking about. If you have Hallmark cards and you have Hallmark, you know, uh, something else, and Hallmark to be out, uh, and then you aggregate three sort of them and you realize that they, they, they will give you yes. Right? You get a class, don't you? Yeah. Okay, right? Yeah. So, how much do you have left? About 10 slides, I can finish it by 10 minutes. No, I'm not. Why don't you take it up in the
Thank you, class.